I would like to introduce you to our speaker today. So let me read off his introduction. So, please uh, meet Sriram Krishnan. He is currently the head of interna international growth at Tinder. He has a strong track record of building global, regional, and local businesses. He was previously the co-founder and the CEO of Cosmify. He was also the vice president of Business at Human and the head of new markets at Spotify. Also, a fun fact, Sriram is a travel junkie and has lived in over eight countries. So please give a round of applause to our speaker of the day. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, I'm also Malaysian, fun fact. Uh, before we start, how many of you, um, just a quick poll, how many of you run your own company, startup? Okay. How many of you work at a startup? Uh, okay. Well, most of you are founders, great. How many of you have raised funding before? Okay. How many of you are raising funding or will be raising funding? Okay. Very good. Um, so this is a, f a f just as any other aspect of uh, in a startup in, in a startup's life cycle, fundraising is is a, is a very important facet, a very important process that you need to l learn and, and, and know about, right? Uh, for various reasons, because uh, in most cases, startups within technology, whether it's consumer or business or the B two B space don't make money or tend to only reach profitability after a long time. So prior to reaching profitability, you actually need money to survive. So venture funding invariably is the, is, is the first, um, is, is the first uh, option or avenue that startups resort to. Um, so a little bit about me, I, I, I run international growth at Tinder. I've, I've, also, I've also angel invested in 30 plus companies, um, started five years ago. Instead of going to business school um, for two years, I said, why don't I learn about startups and technology and investing through investing uh, in startups? So I did that and learned a lot. Haven't lost one startup uh, out of 30 plus one uh, fell apart. So it's still, it's, it's still a relatively decent track record, two exits. Uh, but just, and you guys know this, in a, it takes about five to seven to 10 years for a startup to, uh, to actually uh, have an exit or do something meaningful. So it's actually a long and and uh, tiring process. All right. So mm -hmm. am I pressing the right? I I really do well in. S s s awkward in silence times. I start sweating. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Maybe, maybe it's this. The battery's dead, no? All right, I want to preface everything I'm going to say by saying that everything that I'm saying uh, is actually available online. Um, it's a very, it's a, it's a thoroughly uh, covered area. So Google seed funding, how to raise your funds, how to raise your first seed funds and all that. And you'll get a lot of interesting material. Uh, the book that I read about eight, nine years ago that really helped me understand um, venture funding, the terms, however complicated or simple, uh, is Venture Deals by Brad, Brad Feld. And it's a book that uh, I read once, cover to cover, and I've had to consistently go back and, uh, uh, and, 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 and read uh, certain chapters just to, I mean, I, I, I refresh myself by going back to this book every, every six months or so, whenever I have to negotiate a, a, a fundraising round for my portfolio or raise money for my company or actually invest in companies to, uh, just to understand ba basic terms. So this is something I would encourage all of you to buy uh, and just keep if you're interested in startups and venture funding. So uh, do you need to raise venture capital? So I assume the answer here is yes, but I also want to give you some background as to the types of companies that generally require venture funding. Um, if you're planning to build a, a, a billion dollar business, um, yet then yes, you kind of need venture funding because in order to build a billion dollar business, you need to have the fuel 
to last a few years before hitting that, that, that benchmark, right? You're not going to build a billion dollar business within a year or two. Very few companies in the world do that. Uh, Uber Eats, maybe Slack in three, four years, but, but again, they're not many com most of the uh, companies out there do not reach this valuation very quickly, so you need to sustain yourself. Um, if you're a cash cow business, uh, if, you're, if you're a laundry mart, and that's fine because it's a cash cow business, you don't need venture funding because you're going to have a lot of cash every month on a recurring basis. Uh, addressable market is really small, the world of laundry marts. Uh, is, is very location specific, so you're not going to actually be a billion dollar business until you, unless you acquire other laundromats. And then in that case, you need funding, but you don't need venture funding, you need debt financing, right? So that's a different type of funding. Uh, but, but if you're building a fast consumer, a fast, if you intend to build a fast growing consumer or a B2B business, then you would probably resort to venture funding. Um, fundraising is so difficult. Uh, it's sexy, it sounds really sexy, but it's so brutal. Uh, you go in with the intention of, of, selling, of, of, of selling your value proposition. Uh, you go in with, with this high, you go in confident, you come out battered, you come out questioning your motives, you come out questioning your, 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 um, your sense of self-worth because it's, it's an arduous process. And investors see thousands of deals a day, uh, sorry, thousands of deals a year, and they only make two to three investments a year. So they are their answers are always no. And your ability to, on, to, to take that repeatedly 40, 50 times during any session uh, is, 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 will be put to test, and you have to, you have to see through that. Um, there, are other, there, there are things that I would, I would actually encourage you guys to read also. Uh, 20 questions to ask yourself before, start, before fundraising, the value of fundraising, which I'd highly encourage reading because, again, there's so, there's so much material out there. And once we break into Q&A, we can also start discussing certain nuances that you want to be covered, whether it's related to your business or otherwise. So do you need to raise venture capital? If you're, if you're not planning on making any money uh, in the first two, three, four, five years of operations, uh, if you intend to be in, in a, in a fast-growing business, if you have an addressable market that's billion dollars, then yes, investors would be interested in meeting you. So now that, now that, you've, decided to raise your, now that you've decided to raise money, uh, and you've got this idea, uh, when do you need to raise your first money, right? People resort to, there's, there's something called the three Fs, the friends, families, and fools. So they typically end up being the first uh, group of people who will give you money. Uh, I've been a friend, a fool, and a family to some. Um, and it's fine, and that's just the risk that you take as an angel investor, right? Um, and these are people I trust, and, and, and I end up, uh, end, uh, end up investing in them. So. Um, when you raise your money is very much dependent on who you are, what your idea is, what your product is, what traction you've gotten. If you are a very credible second time entrepreneur with a history of selling your first company or doing well in your last company, and off the back of that, let's say you got acquired or you IPO'd and you transitioned out of the company and you take a six month break in Bali and South America and you come back with this another idea Right? And then you meet a bunch of venture capitalists here and you say, hey, I've got this idea that I want you to fund me. Uh, I've got this idea and I want you to fund me. A lot of you would say yes, because there's credibility and there's, there's established track record. Right? So in, in that case, an idea and an addressable market is sufficient because people will back you because you've done it before and you're successful. But not many people like that exist. So 99% uh, of us are first-time entrepreneurs. So if you're a first-time entrepreneur, the barrier, unfortunately, is a bit higher, right? You need to show that you've got an idea. You need to show that you've sort of parlayed your idea into a product, a minimum viable product, MVP, that not only has traction, but it's also solving a problem, right? So now how do you fund that? So that is friends, families, and fools, right? Um, and once you have that, then you, you, you typically go to an a, a group of angel investors or institutional fund to to basically seek seek funding. Um, in the U.S., because there's a lot more money than th there's a lot more supply of money than there is talent. Um, there's competition amongst venture capital firms, so this has led to the creation of what they call pre-seed. So pre-seed is if you've got an idea 
and you've got the right experience and customer empathy to execute on the idea because you've been thinking about this problem for a long time and your passion in this area and your empathy with the customer is very apparent and you've got an addressable market that is potentially billion dollars or it's a new addressable market that you're creating, then pre-seed funds will typically back you and they'll give you 50K, 100K just to tease your idea out, right? So pre-seed exists in the US. It doesn't exist that much in Europe. Definitely, I don't think it exists in Asia. So the barrier towards, the barrier is slightly higher, but over time, as more money comes in to the region, because people are very bullish about Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, then I think in five, 10, 15 years, you're gonna see the creation of smaller funds that will done fund pre-seed, seed, pre-A, A, post-A, pre-B, pre post pre and, and so on. So in the US, uh, what typically was a seed A, B, C is now pre-seed, seed, post-seed, post -seed, um, extended seed, pre-A, A, post-A, post so it's, it's ridiculous. Um, but, but, the, but the reasons are more or less the same. <coughs> so now that you've decided to raise money uh, and you've realized that, uh, hey, I've got this idea that I, I've, I've got this idea and I've enlisted the help of a couple of engineers, I've paid friends who have paid 600 ringgit a month to help me code and I've given them X percent of the company in return. And I've, I've got this working prototype that's half working and half not working. Um, and I'm still talking to customers, trying to figure out whether my app or my service is solving a problem. Do I raise now? No, right? Because you want to be, f you want to, you want to know for a fact that it, it is solving a problem, and it ha does have some traction. So you, what you do is you continue iterating on the product until it solves a problem, and then you go to everyone and get 200 people on your product, and and if it solves a problem for them and they're retained long term or mid term, then you know you've got something on your hand, right? And then if if that product takes off automatically through word of mouth, 5% week on week, 10% week on week, whatever that metric is, then you've got something compelling to go to your venture capital or to go to, go to, to, go to your seed fund. Um, how much, so now, now you're faced with the prospect of trying to figure out how much to raise. Um, and by the way, before you go, and I'm gonna keep going back and forth, uh, just to troll you guys, but, but now that you've decided to go meet venture funds, um, how much do you want to raise, right? So before meeting, before meeting investors, and there's so many things you have to do before meeting them, uh, you, need, you need to understand what your, 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 you need to project what your cost would look like for the next uh, 12 to 18 months. So this means you need to take into account new hires that you're gonna make. So let's say that with your current product, you've got two engineers that, that are paid it's a thousand ringgit a month because they're doing it for sweat equity. Um, they're, you, you give them a piece of the company and you have a working product that actually people use, right? Let's say it's uh, uh, an app that understands uh, with OC, uh, with, with character recognition, understands the food. You take a picture of a food and it tells you what the food is, right? Now, uh, and it's growing like, not wildfire, it's growing like two, three percent week on week, five percent week on week, which is encouraging because you're not actually s investing in marketing. Um, you need to figure out what uh, the, the size of team that you need, right? So you need maybe a couple of my engineers, maybe not. Maybe you need to convert these guys into full time. How much would they cost to project? Uh, you might need someone to work on your app or your website. How much? When would the headcount come in? Cost? So you really need to project this up to maybe six months, twelve months, eighteen months. Uh, you have to have multiple scenarios. So aggressive, conservative. What if we actually grow like wildfire? We might need a marketeer in in month seven, month five. Um, what if we take off really, really f fast and you might need it, and then you need, you need to account for technology costs, right? So project that and figure out what it is. And then go in with the intention of raising for 12 to 16 months. Uh, people will say 12 to 18 months, but it doesn't matter where you land. Give you enough, raise enough ammunition for you to last a couple of, or two, two to three product cycles. So when you iterate on your product, it fails, you have, you have another click to go and build something else. And if that fails, you have another click to go build something else, right? Um, milestones are more important than time frame. So when you when you when you meet when you meet investors, it's it's better if you position it. You, you don't tell them I'm raising this because it gives me 12 month, 12 months of uh, leave, uh, runway. Go in and say with this amount of money, you're able to 
build this MVP feature and grow into this. Build this additional features that you think will, be def will help your company be defensible. And you build a moat around technology and for key hires, right? So go in with the intention of spending the money and show them how you're gonna spend the money. So that's, that's important. So let's say, let's, let's, use a, let's use a scenario where you've got an idea, you've got two engineers helping you out, and uh, you've projected and you might need anywhere between uh, $70,000 to $200,000 US dollars to last you 18 months. So in my case, I would just go and go for the conservative and ask and, and make and, and make a sort of compelling enough 150k 200k round, right? So that's that's what I would do. Uh, earn the set of uh, a caution. Um, now, a lot of this is also dependent on if you're starting the company for the if you're if you're doing this for the first time and you care about um, how much I mean, you have to care about. You don't don't care so much about the valuation of the company. Uh, your valuation of the company could be. I mean, five hundred thousand dollars, a million, two million, three million, eight million doesn't matter what it is. Uh, optimize for ownership and dilution, uh, because r regardless of whether your company is valued at three or four or eight, I mean, it's, that's not going to de determine whether you're successful in the future, right? Uh, ownership is more important, um, and and play for the long game. Don't don't fight over the nitty gritty uh, when it comes to valuation. So ownership typically. Um, at this first money in, you're not going to go anything above 25%. People who are people who request for anything more than 25 are predatory, and I would avoid them. Um, y Combinator, y com, y Combinator takes, it's, which is it's an accelerator based in the U.S., uh, takes 7%, uh, and it's a three-month program. So they value add because they have a great network. They've got a bunch of amazing partners to help you out. Magic also uh, helps out with accelerators. So uh, I don't know what magic's. I don't know whether Magic take. Uh, whether they take anything or not, but but normally it's within five to twenty percent, depending on the money they take, right? So that's that's a very reasonable piece of equity to give out, so that you don't get diluted. Um, now, then the question is, how much do you value your company? Um, in the U.S., it can range from three to nine, uh, if you've got the right talent, if you've got the right product, some growth or lots of growth addressable market, traction, press, hype, then you can go for the nine to 10, maybe 12. Um, if you're new, uh, first time, without any traction per se, it could be three, four. So it's very, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's an art, not a science. Uh, it's how you land your pitch. It's how you talk about the potential. It's how much, uh, how many VCs you meet. So if you meet a lot of VCs and you realize that um, that you might be undervaluing your company, then, then you might want to increase the valuation a little bit. But then again, that's a bit too slimy because once you've told one VC one valuation, then it's not necessarily nice to go and change the valuation uh, when you're meeting another VC because people talk unless they come in and bid and give you a term sheet that is significantly higher. Then you can start asking others to match, but they won't, but they can do that. Um, yeah, so be conservative. Don't worry too much about valuation. Care about ownership and cap it at 20% just on the safe side. Um, that's all I would do. This doesn't mean that you should give 20%, auto give 20%, but, but fix on a valuation that you think makes sense. Uh, then design on a f fix a valuation or design on a funding, that you th uh, funding amount that you think makes sense and then figure out the ownership that way. All right. So how should I raise the, the, the money? So... Uh, um, it's a it's a very straightforward process. About ten years ago, um, I think the first deal I the first investment I made was a price round. So and it was a bunch of documents I didn't understand a single thing I was reading, uh, but I signed it anyway, which I shouldn't have. Uh, but it was fine because it, it was a Series A investment. But but over the past six seven years, people have resorted to convertible debt. So there are three ways to raise money. There is equity through a price round. So this means that. Um, the investor will actually get a stake in your company outright. So you have 100% of your company, you give out 20% um, for X, and the investor now, after the round is complete, the investor now owns X percent. So it's on the cap table and the capitalization cap table, and is, he's, he or she is now an owner. And this is a very long process. Um, it's expensive because you require law firms on both ends to actually deal with this process. And the VCs actually uh, will bill you for the law for the law for their law firm fees, right? So, which is a bit of a sneaky thing to do, but they but they do it. Um, 
what startups do these days is they raise money through a convertible debt. What this means is they loan you the money, right? Let's say they loan you $250,000. Now, the, the terms on this deal would be, uh, it's still a loan, so which means you're expected to get an interest. There's a maturity date. But, but, if you, but the, the terms stipulate that if you raise another price round in the future, or term, a, note, a note round in the future, then these terms automatically convert into equity. So let's say that you are raising a note at a three million cap. Now a three million cap doesn't necessarily mean you're val valued at three million. It just means that the, no the, the cap on the, on, the c on the debt is three million. So let's say they invest $300,000 at a three million cap. It means in the next round, with 0% interest and forget maturity, it means that in the next round, if you raise at three million valuation, the $300,000 converts at that valuation. So they own 10% of the company. If you raise at $4 million valuation, it means that that $300,000 converts at $3 million valuation. That's a cap, right? If you raise at $2 million, that $3 million, the $300,000 converts at $2 million, right? So it, it is sort of, the, I use cap as an implied valuation. So if, fund, if, if, if companies are raising a convertible note and they have a very high cap, then personally for me, it, I, what I imply is that's how much they value the company. Uh, now and for the next six months. Anyway, it's, it, it can sound pretty complicated, but if you Google it and read it long enough, it'll make sense. It took me a long time to make sense, for it to make sense. Um, the other option is safe documents. So safe documents is convertible note without the interest in maturity. So it's exactly what I said earlier, except all the complicated terms. Um, so I would advise companies to go to YC, Y Combinator's website and just download this um, and just use it. Uh, you might want to tweak the, the location of jurisdiction thing. Um, I don't know whether it's Malaysia, Singapore. I don't know what makes sense, but, but I'll tweak that. But this would be the easiest and safest thing to, to do because it's just straightforward. If investors come to you and say, hey, I'm going to get, I'm going to do this, but I also want warrants and rev share and profit share, then say no, bye-bye, uh, because it's not worth it. Uh, warrants is, I mean, uh, it, 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 it's, a co it's, a, it's, a, it's a mechanism, it's, it's, it's often used in latter, s in latter rounds. Uh, it's an option to convert into, into, into equity, and convert revenue into equity and so on, but it's not, it's not worth it. It's, it's just a time sink and a resource thing to actually talk about. Uh, so stick to, stick to this. Uh, so some companies, for example, small companies might raise, so there's a company I invested in uh, that raised at a three million cap, and then they've got some traction, they needed they raised small amounts of money. So the benefit of this versus this is this closes very quickly. So you have two, three months to close, and then you're done. And then if you want to raise more money, you can't raise it on this round because it's done. You have to open up a new round and raise. So if you raise, but if you raise it, if you raise the money through this, it means if you raise two hundred thousand dollars now, and in four months you need a little bit more money because you're seeing traction and you want to pour gasoline on fire, you can pretty much raise on the same because this node is open. It's never closed. Now the, the, the downside to this is investors who raise on this, who, who put in money on this round would go, hey, why are you allowing another investor to come in six months down the line now that you've got more traction, so you actually valued higher, right? So go raise another note. And then you have, to ra then you have notes over notes over notes over notes, uh, which is really annoying. I'll come to that in a bit. So, so this gives you some leeway. So if you're raising $100,000 now and you've raised that amount of money and six months down the line, let's say you don't have, let's say your valuation of the company hasn't gone up tremendously. So let's say it's in the same ballpark because it's all approximate anyway, right? It's subjective. So let's say you don't want to go increase your valuation, that's fine. And you want to raise a little bit more money, you can raise it off this round very easily. You just add more money and same safe note, send it to the invest investor for them to sign. Um, but what you also don't want is you don't want a situation where, let's say you raise a safe at three million cap and then eight months later you've got traction and you want to raise it at five million cap, that's fine. Uh, but, but if you raise a smaller money, amount of money in caps, um, that's okay because when it converts later, you're converting, giving out a small percentage of equity. Uh, but you're raising big on cap and then another big on cap. What happens is when you do your price round in the future through a series A, and when you do a price round, you have to get a board, and you have to form a board, and you have to do a bunch of other things. And then when it all converts, right? Imagine a stack, a waterfall where everything converts. Your $300,000 at 3 million converts into 
uh, 10 million pre-A. So what does that mean? That means 10%, okay. But what if you've got, five, you've raised $500,000 at 5 million cap, that's another 10%. And you've raised, and then, and, then, and then before you know it, you actually dilute yourself a, a lot more than what you think you have uh, already. So because of that, you can't raise a $10 million price round because now you have to raise a $15 million, $20 million price round for you to maintain the same level of ownership. You don't have to go into the nitty gritty, but if you raise notes on notes on notes, if you raise a lot of money on notes on notes on notes on notes, once it stacks and converts, if you assume that through your calculation that you will want to own the same percentage of equity, if you assume that you're going to be owning X percent, in order for you to have that X percent, you need to have a significantly higher valuation. And then at that point, the investors will go and say, you're not, uh, you're not valued that highly. So it happened a couple of times to my portfolio company. Uh, but what they're doing now is instead of going raising the price round, they're actually <laughs> they're raising more notes. So good luck to them. <laughs> uh, it, once it converts, it's going to be a headache uh, to figure out. Um, so yeah, so just so, so keep it simple, um, and and it should be pretty straightforward. Uh, you don't need lawyers. I mean, you need lawyers, yes, but 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 get the lawyers to 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 sanity check stuff and so to go through the documents, uh, and you should be fine. Sorry, I'm gonna stop and ask questions, yeah. How many of you, yeah, sorry. Oh, I thought you were asking for questions. Yeah, asking for questions. Um, I originally have been working in the market on day one, and I actually have been speaking with, I know I've been talking actually about how much I've been on the market. It's one thing, but secondly, it's that assuming that it can be done, and I was really confused about whether it's more to be taken out of the market. Yeah, yeah. So let me take a step back and talk about. So she mentioned the term discount, and we're going to go into the nitty gritty here. Which, thank God, I read Brad Feld's book before coming. Uh, I'm going to introduce a bunch of other terms also, so just to complement that, right? So in a convertible, in a convertible note, you have. Oh, this is going to be fun. Um, so a convertible note, you have uh, a valuation cap. Um, you have interest, you have maturity, you have discount, and this could be uncapped. Oh my god, we're going to specifics, and this could be like X, right? Um, okay, this is mostly it. Um, to answer your question, okay, what it say? Maturity is basically if you're lending someone money you're saying, hey, in two years, I expect you to pay me back. If you don't pay me back, this will convert into equity, right? So that's maturity. Interest is interest normal. If I give you $10,000, I expect you to pay me back with interest. Valuation cap is what I said earlier. Um, if, I, if I'm raising at a three million cap, I'm, if I'm raising at 300,000 at three million cap, if my next price round is five, my 300,000 will convert at three. If my next round is valued at two, my 300,000 will convert at two. Right, so it's the better. It's the better. It's three is the highest my 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 denominator will go. So if I put in three hundred thousand dollars into your company and you give me a three million cap, this is how high it will go. If you raise if you raise your next round at four million cap, my three hundred will convert at three. Sorry, four million priced, it'll convert at three. If you go raise it at two million priced, it'll convert at three. So sorry, it'll convert at two. So at four million, I'll get ten percent of your company. At three million, I'll get ten percent of your company. At two million, I'll get uh, fifteen more, fifteen percent of the company, right? So that aside, now discount. Ooh boy, okay. I'll, I'll answer. I promise I'll answer your question in a bit. No, there. So it, it, it's there's there's no zero it's a, it's a zero, it's, there's no zero sum game here. So as an investor, uh, so I'll answer your question first and then take a step back, right? So I've I've signed deals. Uh, discount is nice. A discount is actually investor friendly. Uh, it's not founder friendly, because what this means is, um, if you get a twenty percent discount, it means that this uh, okay. Let's 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 use this case, right? Uh, um, I raise at three million cap, and I eventually raise at three million price round, so ten percent. What this means is, I get a twenty percent discount. If let's say if you give a twenty percent discount, it means that the number of shares that I will own at ten percent 
is let's say make it let's keep it simple and say three hundred thousand dollars. But it, because you're giving me three hundred thousand shares, no, it doesn't make sense. Uh, <laughs> let's let's say you have a hundred shares, right, of this company that's worth ten percent. A twenty percent discount is you're giving me more shares, so you're giving me one hundred twenty shares. Now one hundred twenty shares will convert at uh, something higher than ten percent, so which is good for me. So a discount is good for me because for the same amount of money and the same shares, I'm, uh, for the same amount of money, it converts at a much lower price. So I'm effectively getting more shares at the high valuation. So a discount is very uh, investor friendly, but it's up to you to set the discount. So 10 to 20 is very normal. 10 to 15 is usually what I've done, uh, and I don't really care because it's such. It's an early. If it's an early round, like if you want to incentivize investors to come on board, give them 10 to 15. It's fine. Don't give them anything. It's fine. Some of them will ask for it. Give it. It's fine. No big deal. Uh, valuation cap. Uh, don't do uncapped. Uh, what what uncapped note basically means? Uncapped mo note is free money, right? Don't do this unless you're like a Slack Series A. Don't do this unless you're a Slack and everyone wants to invest in you, right? What does uncapped note mean? This is gonna be okay. So this is your seed, um, and this is your A, right? Uncapped note is gonna piss a bunch of people off, but if you've got so much more demand than supply, sorry, then demand than than uh, the normal, then you could go for it, but I wouldn't do it. Let's say, if you're, let's say you're raising $100,000 uncapped, right? Let's assume that the terms are standard, or let's say it's safe where it's simple, at, at, at uncapped. So what this means, if my Series A valuation is one million, right? It means I convert at 10%. If my Series A valuation is two million, I convert at uh, five percent. Five million, I convert at. I convert at. Two point five percent, right? Two percent. Sorry, engineering major can't do math. Um, but what this means is you're giving free money, right? So it's the equivalent. It means investors, you're getting free money, because if you remove this, at seed stage, for the risk they are taking. It's the same thing as investing at your A, right? If they take this money and invest at A at these various valuations, they'll still get that equity position, right? So they're putting in money now for the same equity position they would have gotten in the future if they participated in your A, right? So you're actually giving money uh, away for free. You're giving future money for free. So investors don't like it. So let me give you another scenario, 100K at, at 100 million. So again, then it's the same thing. Right, so if you if, let's say if, let's say if you're going if you're growing very very quickly, let's say your valuation implied valuation is 50 million, right? Now, your implied valuation is 50 million. You're raising at 50. Okay, sorry, sorry. Let, let's go back to this scenario, and this is uncapped, right? Now let's assume that you raise at a cap, so 100k at two cap, right? For the same scenario, at one million, you get 100 divided by one, you get 10 percent, right? So for the same scenario at one million you get 10%. 100K at 2 million, you get 5%, right? Which is everything is normal so far. Now, 100K at 5 million, because the cap is at 2, you still convert at 2, so you're getting 5% instead of 2%, right? So that's why the investors want the cap in. Because if you grow quickly, if your valuation is 5, if it's uncapped, you, they get 2%. But if it's capped at 2, then if you're valued at 5, they, get, they convert at 2. So to answer your question about discounts, give discounts, it's fine. Um, I mean, 5%, 10%, 15% normal. 20% is a bit too high, but it's not uncommon. But it's an easy give. It's an easy give. Yeah. Questions? All right, let's continue. Fun, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, so you have to have, okay, uh, it depends on the fine print, right? It depends on the fine print. Most investors know that if you don't get your money back, then, I mean, you're not going to get your money back, right? So that's a risk that investors have to bear. Um, and if your company goes bankrupt, then there's no way the company can pay you back. Now, what if the company still exists? and you're way past the maturity date, right? Now, what generally happens is you and the company renegotiate. So which means 
you convert at a much higher valuation or you, you keep that ruling. So the maturity date, you push it back into the future. So it's, it's up to you and the company. Um, asking the c money back from the company is not, um, it's, it's, it's frowned upon because again, you're investing in the company without, I mean, even though it's a convertible debt, but you're not investing in it for, for you to get back your money within your, you're not, in, you're not investing to get your interest, right? You're investing for exponential return as an investor. So if you ask, so there's risk that you have to absorb. But if you go and ask your portfolio, hey, could you give me back the 60K that we invested in that, I mean, no one's gonna invest with you in the future. It's just frowned upon. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so there's, there's, there's a good question. I, I didn't want to mention that number because I don't want to be held to that. Um, but what's usually good, um, it's, it's what's considered good is more than 15% week on week. Um, word of mouth, so without marketing. So without marketing, organic 15% week on week. Um, if you've got five to 10%, it means you're, I mean, that's good, but it means that you've got steady growth. So. It's not bad. Uh, it means that people are actually eating your product, but but that's also still encouraging. But if you have 15% week and week organic, then that tends to be a bit more exciting for investors. Five to 10% is still okay. Yeah. So that's a good one. So week on week growth is basically. Oh, that, this is now. This this is when you can. This is when it gets. It could get very interesting now also. So week on week could be this cumulative growth, the cumulative growth and week on week growth, right? So week on week growth, what startups care about, what investors care about is they care about new users. So day zero, you have, let's say you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven new users uh, this week, right? So by day two, you have three users. By day three, you have six users. But in day three, you've added three users, right? So one plus two plus three plus five plus five plus six or seven is your cumulative total user base by day seven, right? So now, investors would like to see, ideally, they'd like to see new user growth of more than 15%, so which means if you've added new users, seven new users on, on, on Friday, on, on Sunday, it means they'd like to see you add uh, seven into 1.15, uh, eight and, and, and eight or nine new users by the following Sunday, new users on that day, right? B uh, so that's one, ideally. But if you've got massive adoption anyway, then a cumulative of 15% week on week, it's also okay in the earlier stage, right? So long as, I mean, remember when you're launching your product, your cumulative growth is gonna exponentially, it's gonna, your chart is gonna be like this. Right? You're gonna start off seeing massive, like 100% day-on-day growth. You're gonna start off with one user in day one, and then day two, you're gonna have three users. That's 200%. Don't, don't pitch that to any investors, because they'll slap you in the face, okay? And over time, your day-to-day -day, day -day -day growth is gonna obviously uh, lower, right? Oh, sorry, sorry. your day-on-day your day -day growth could be the same, or could be going up. That means that's good. But your cumulative day-to-day -day could be decreasing, the rolling, sort of moving average type. Uh, so you wanna pitch, the, if the, the savvy investors will dig a bit deeper and say what's in, wh how many new users you got last month and how many new users you're getting this month. And then they'll ask you cumulatively how much you have grown. So be transparent and show everything. Because if you show one and not show the other, they'll be like, oh, you're trying to hide something, right? You guys understand, right, what I'm saying? Okay, good. Any more? Okay. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, this is what I did for my company. Um, and, okay, so we deliberately kept it low. So we raised, uh, the, one th the one that we sold um, about two years ago, we deliberately kept it low because we just wanted people to invest. And we, we, kn we cared about equity and we raised about 100, 150 at a three million cap, which is low for, for the Bay Area. Uh, and we wanted people to put in money because it's such a low valuation. And we know we were going into the company with the intention of selling it. So we, we sold companies before and we're doing this with the intention of selling it. Now, that doesn't mean that we appropriately price the company, right? Again, it's very subjective. It's very hard for me to answer. It's very much dependent on 
the talent that you have in the team and customer empathy. So if you've got people who have been in banking for 10 years and trying to build a financial product, good. That means on the team side, you've got check, which means you can, you, that means you've got a good, a good upside here. Good, like from a value perspective, that's like very interesting, right? If you've got a team of bankers that are trying to fix a logistics problem, and then you've got no product, no idea, no growth, then you're not gonna, then getting a three million valuation is, then you're, you're valued at, I mean, you're valued so much lower. So I would say I'm making stuff up now, it could be 200,000, 500,000, 600,000, right? If you've got, it's so subjective. It's so subjective. It very much depends on team, founder background, addressable market, whether you have a product or not, whether you have an idea slash product or not, MVP, traction, growth, and then all combined. If you've got amazing traction, amazing addressable market, amazing team, amazing product, then you can go for nine to 12 as your first round. But in the Valley, companies have raised 25 million at 100 million valuation as their first round. I'm not saying do that, because that, that's, I mean, I, I'm not saying that's bullshit or otherwise, I'm just saying that's just impossible. Um, you do have stories like that, but stay humble, stay, stay on the low side, and focus on equity. Focus on getting the money that you need to build your product, uh, and giving out as little equity as you can. But give out appropriate amounts of equity, don't give out too much. And then re you can arrive at your valuation by looking at the amount that you want to raise, plus the equity you want to give away. And then you reverse math, you, through math, you can figure out what the valuation is. So that's another way to do it. Question? Okay. Yep, yes. Sorry, so the question is, wh when you sh when you should you when should you? What do you mean traction? Why did you get the traction? Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Well, but how did you fund it for the last one year? One funding. Okay. And now you've seen traction, right? Uh, and how is that traction organic or through paid marketing? Okay, then that would be a good time to show. Then, then okay, then then you come, then you then you sort of face an interesting um, uh, dilemma or situation, right? Then if you know that you've got organic growth, and because you've done a year's worth of tweaking, and you're like, wait a minute, this is taking off. Um, then what you could do is, okay, my general strategy is if you've bootlegged all the way, if you've got funding, if you've got the funds to continue bootlegging it. I advise companies to s raise funding as late as you can. Stay clear from venture capitalists as, th remember the capitalists, they're venture, but they're also capitalists, right? Uh, so, s so stay away from venture funding as, 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 far, out as, as, as far out as you can. Um, because this means that you give yourself more manure maneuverability to, to do whatever you want pre-funding. Pre and also, the, 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 the later you raise, the more equity you, 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 you own and the, the better position you're in to leverage better deals, right? So if you're, if you're seeing high growth, great. I mean, like, like you, there's a point, in, I mean, then you have to decide, right? Then you have to decide whether, hey, you know what? I don't think this growth is going to sustain in month six, seven, and eight. So let me raise now off the back of this growth so that I can focus more on building growth. Uh, and then there could be a scenario where you say, you know what, I'm going to wait for a longest period of time before raising, and then by then your growth would have slowed down, and then you would have gone, oh my God, I need to actually manufacture growth to go fundraise. So it's a very sub subjective, it's very subjective. There's no right or wrong answer here, but uh, yeah. I would generally do it when it's hot, because I know I'm, o I'm optimizing for ownership. So if it's hot, I don't care about my valuation, I, I care about giving away, as getting as much money as little, uh, give, give, getting a lot of money in, a lot of appropriate money in and giving out as little as possible. Now that would imply that the valuation would be high, but it doesn't have to be. I could raise 200,000, 300,000, 500,000 at, and give away 5%. No, that's a lot. Uh, no, I don't know, I'm, my math is very wonky now, but, but yeah, so, yeah. Um, who should you raise from? I think we're all um, aware of who these people are. Uh, Institutional investors are professional investors. Keep that in mind. They m they're, they're very friendly. They're very r they might be very relatable, uh, but that's what they do. They're professional investors. They 
see a thousand deals a year and they only invest in three. So it's their job to say no, don't take it personally. Uh, they will pass and they'll give you all sorts of reasons why they're not investing. And sometimes you have to read between the lines and if you've done this all long enough, you don't understand what they're, what they're trying to mean, what they're trying to say by what, uh, what they say. But, the one, but, but some of them are more straightforward. They'll tell you, look, you don't have an adjustable market that's big enough for me. Look, you're in an area that I'm not interested in. Look, we just don't believe in the depth of the quality of the product. Your product's not defensible. So these are very common, common excuses why people don't invest. Look, you're too early for us. You're too early for us means you need to get more traction, product market fit, MVP, and then, and then come back later. So, so uh, it's, 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 it's hard to stand out. Uh, but it takes a long time because they want to meet you multiple times. Uh, there's pre-seeds to Series A, Series B, Series C. Um, angel investors like me, um, I do this because it's a great way to learn, a great, great way to expand my knowledge base, uh, a great way to expand my network. Um, I, I've invested in a couple of companies, like I mean, a few companies here also. Sorry, who who are, who, who are speaking here, and it's just like I meet great, f uh, like I I, made, I meet great people. I expand my knowledge base. I I, I get access to uh, their problems and I try to solve them. If I can't solve them, then at least I know that this type, these type of problems uh, exist and occur so that when I, in my real job, will, when I face them, I'll be able to attack them from a different perspective. So the angels like me who generally would follow VCs, uh, some of these angels, uh, it's easier to convince them because they do this, I mean, for the return, but also to do this for a variety of other reasons that you may not necessarily understand. So some of the reasons why I gave you. Uh, I give you, but they they generally follow institutional VCs, right? You want to get a good lead for angels to follow. Uh, the other option is if you get a super angel, someone who actually invests, someone who's <laughs> who's done the angel investing ten years ago, twelve years ago, fifteen years ago, and got one hit, right? People talk. Sorry, I'm gonna take a step back and rant a little bit, but venture capital is one of the very few industries in the world where you can be 99% wrong and still be successful. Actually, no, you can't. You are 99% wrong and you're still successful. Because you need a one big hit. You invest 100 million to Amazon. That's worth, that's a lot of money, 100, 10 million to Amazon. That's worth 100 billion now. That's all you need. You need that one hit. You can ride on that for the rest of your life, right? So super angels are angels who, who, who happen to strike gold. And now instead of cutting 10K checks, they're cutting 100, 100K checks, right? So uh, if you get a super angel, to cut to you that first 100K, 200K check, then you can also go and expand your investor base with a bunch of other angels. What I generally advocate for, if you're a small company, is to diversify your investor base early on. Don't go crazy, don't go, don't go up to 15, I mean, use judgment, but don't go up to 15, 20, 25, 30 investors, because then when it converts, when you have a cap table, it's gonna be very messy. You're gonna have to buy them out later and so on, it's gonna be very messy. So keep, uh, so, so wh what do I mean by expanding your cap table, expanding your investor base? So let's say your angel, let's say a super angel or your VC is your lead firm, so that person could be on your board if it's a price round, or could be your mentor, uh, otherwise. Um, and then you get a couple of angels, like try to get your angels who are tacticians, who are operators, to come in and help out. So if you've got someone who's done marketing and BD in larger companies, and you think that person's relevant for your company, then if that person's an investor, go approach and pitch that person, because if he or she comes on board, then they can help you out tactically, right, operationally. Get someone who's done PR, get someone who's done international. So just try to build a well-rounded uh, investment team, uh, or investor team. Uh, if you can't do that, get a bunch of advisors instead. Don't give out a lot of equity, but if you can, do to the ones who actually really provide value add. But make sure that you build a good enough a well-rounded enough team that can support you uh, mentally as well as sort of from a knowledge-based perspective. Um, meeting investors. So um, this is arguably, I think, the most important thing that you have, oh, like, like most important thing that you need to, to, um, to prepare for. Now, I just wanna also say that getting a meeting is really, really hard. It's really hard because they're gonna judge you based on, and there's a slide that I should have mentioned before this, actually, it's like sending shit to investors, like sending deck to, decks to investors, because at this point, it means they're interested in you enough to actually know more about the company. But prior to this, you actually have to email them and arrange a meeting, right? You have to pitch to them via email. So you have to make sure that your company, your presentation, your slides, all this are simplified, you get, to the, you get to the crux of everything very quickly, you articulate your team, your narrative, your vision very effectively. Um, 
So that's a very important step that you have to overcome. You have to entice them through email. They have to open everything that you write in your email should be checked, double checked, triple checked, sanity checked, everything, and then your deck should be like succinct and to the point. Uh, most investors won't read the email. They'll just, I mean, it, it's funny because I, whenever I get pitches through email, I don't even read the email, I just open the deck. Uh, I don't see who it's from unless it's from a referral, but I just open the deck and then decide on whether I should respond or not. Uh, th that's unfortunate reality, but it is what it is. Uh, I look at the deck and I see the product, I see the team, I see the, I see the team, I see the product, I see the addressable market. I see the traction, if any. Um, and, and these are the four things I see subconsciously. Within 15, within 12 seconds, within less than 10 seconds, I'll then be able to subconsciously decide whether I want to respond to this email. Don't use me as an example, I'm just a minor, I'm just an amateur investor, right? But that's just my thought process. I open an email, hey, Ram, check this deck out by a friend, would you want to meet them? Open the deck, look at the product. If, by looking at the product, I'll be able to know whether it's interesting or not. Because it's an, if it's an area I don't understand, like medical devices, I'll be like, sorry, no bueno. Uh, but if it's within enterprise SaaS, for example, I'll look at, oh, interesting. Whether it's a, whether it's a $500 million, billion dollar company, a potential, whether it's backed, whether it's signaling, signaling is very important, whether it's backed by the right investors, um, but I'm an angel, I see things before institutional investors see. Um, whether it's got the right team, that's very important. Uh, and then signaling also come, comes in. If uh, other prominent angel investors are, have invested, they'll go, oh, okay, I'll, I'll read more, I'll spend more than 20 seconds. Uh, but you need to nail that. Uh, and then, more often than not, uh, because your email is your pitch, you have to nail that. And when you get the meeting, then you have to actually do your double down on your homework. Understand where, what he, what he or she tweets about. Um, don't make it too obvious in your meeting, oh, I saw that you tweeted about this. No, but you have to like in insert it into the conversation in a very nice and sort of subtle way, right? Uh, understand prior investments. Sometimes investors think in the terms of risk. I don't, I don't th I, I mean, I'm an amateur angel investor. I don't think, I used to not think in terms of risk, but now I do. I think, it, I, t I think in terms of exposure, I've got exposure in, and I'm making stuff up now, right? Let's say I've got exposure in cryptocurrency startups and I've got exposure within cryptocurrency across the value chain uh, from a platform perspective and from the currency perspective. I'm not gonna invest anymore in cryptocurrency startups because I've got exposure already. So I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna de risk and not invest in this anymore. Now some investors, uh, if they've invested in healthcare, it doesn't mean they're interested in what you're doing. It doesn't mean they're, inter doesn't, they, it doesn't mean they're not interested or interested in what you're doing. You have to understand where across the value chain they've in invested. And sometimes they might invest in a similar, they, they might invest in you because you're similar to another company but different in some areas. It's a way for them to de-risk. So you need to really figure out what the investment philosophy is. And that's something which I'm, again, l by, by doing, I've also started to do on my own. Think about, Wait, am, have I do, if the housing <laughs> if the housing bubble crashes, if the housing market crashes, am I risked? I'm de, I'm de, am I de-risked enough from all the adjacent areas? So I start thinking about that. So anyway, I, I don't think you should do that when you're doing your background checks on investors, but just understanding that will be very useful. The motivation, right? Um, and then once you got that meeting, uh, it's a rule of thumb that I mean, just just as in any conversation with investors or anyone, if you get the other person to speak. Most of the time, that's better, right? Um, more often than not, you get you'll get peppered with questions, but if you're able to articulately an answer that, answer the questions and confidently, and to understand where your gaps are, predict, to predict uh, what sort of questions they'll ask you, predict where your shortcomings are. So if you know that your idea is not defensible, but you need you need to invest. Uh, you need the money to invest in defensibility through machine learning or building a moat, right? Then you bring that slide up and say, hey, you know what, I know that we're lacking in these two areas, but we need the funding to invest. Then the investor will go, oh my God, okay, you're self-aware to know that you need these two things. So that's great. So you need to start leveling up, right? Um, and, and, but, but if you answer the questions, like there's no correct way of answering questions, but if you answer it confidently and sort of um, able to address the queries, then uh, and able to to, to ask the investor questions about his or her uh, investment philosophy and, and portfolio and so on, then if you get the person to talk, if you get the person to talk more, then you're, th that's generally a good sign. Um, ask for clarity if you don't understand. I've done this a million times where, not asked, but I've also just nodded my head when the investor said, oh, you should do this and this. I'm like, yeah, yeah, warrants, yeah, <laughs> very good. And I had to go back and Google it. Uh, but never be embarrassed. This was a few years ago, I still don't know what warrants. I mean, I do, but I sort of half forgot. 
uh, as we all do. But but always ask for clarity. It doesn't matter how stupid you sound. Uh, it doesn't matter. Ask for clarity. Ask what this means, what that means. What do you mean? Why do you need to know this information? How can I help you, right? Um, be humble. It's the job to say no. Uh, it will hurt your ego. You will be defensive. I've been defensive. Um, um, and it's very, I mean, obviously when I look back, I'm a little bit more confident. Um, I, I am also got ha developed a little bit more of a hard skin uh, and I'm also a little bit a bit more arrogant, uh, <laughs> but but shouldn't be arrogant. But 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 I'm able to I'm able to take no better now than I used to. It's not like I would throw tables, but I'd be like, no no no, it's actually an interesting opportunity. But then if you sort of uh, if you empathize with the position the investor in, that's his or her job, right? To to say to to to, to ask these very pressing questions. So don't be defensive. Uh, answer confidently. And by the way, um, a no now doesn't mean a no later. So. I invested in a company. Um, I invested in a company that was building uh, fertility insurance solutions. It's a market that never it doesn't exist. And I was in, in the pre pre early first money in round. And and what I do as an angel investor is when I put in money, I actually bring it to all my friends, right? Sequoia, Social, Kleiner, everyone. And I say, hey, I put money in. Follow. Some of them do follow. Some of them don't. But for this particular startup, uh, Carrot. Uh, I try to get everyone to invest. I got a couple of other seed funds to invest, which was great, but I didn't get the Series A people to bite, which was really annoying, because some of them do follow me. Uh, but but I was really annoyed. Um, this company got into YC and just launched, and now Softech, which is the leading seed fund, the largest, the, the sort of most successful seed fund, let the last round, let the current round, right? So, uh, and they said no earlier. So a no now doesn't mean no later. Uh, and that was pre-seed. Again, going back to that sort of process, I invested in pre-seed. After YC, they're, invest they're raising seed, so Softex leading that. But it doesn't mean that the socials, the client of of the world will say no later, right? It means that they're still early for them. So keep that in mind because these relationships matter. And the savvy ones in the crowd will actually create an advisory board email group and update these investors, not once a month, that's, that's overkill, but months, once every two months. I've invested in one company just because the founder emailed me every, every month about updates. And I was like, huh, there's progress, that's interesting. Oh, they actually got another angel investor I know, and I called that guy and he was like, yeah, the cool team, and I invested. I said no five times, and, I, and then I invested in. Um, proactively reached out to invest. It's called Luna Labs. Anyway, um, sort of my last slide is on negotiations and closing. Um, Use standard documents as much as possible. So going back to your point, safe. Uh, keep it simple, stupid. Uh, hire a lawyer early. Um, hire a lawyer in any case. Some of them charge once the money uh, is raised. Uh, with lawyers, you can always not pay them. They'll always ask you to pay on time. You don't have to pay them. <laughs> you don't have to. They'll press you and press you as money, money, money. Say it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. You can do that. Uh, pay them last. Uh, in, the in the company that we sold, uh, we we went uh, two years without paying our lawyers, and we paid upon close. Uh, I mean, they were happy, cause, but they were also pissed, but too bad, right? <laughs> uh, we had to prioritize employees and, and storage costs and whatnot. Um, understand the most common standard terms. Again, uh, you have to go through the school of hard knocks for this. Read Brad Feld's venture deals. Read online. Uh, don't trust 100% everything I say. Go online, verify. Uh, trust but verify, right? Read, read all these links that, that, that it's online because it's all, avail it's all publicly available, but read them as much as you can. Uh, and meet as, as many VCs as you can. One lesson here that I want to really, really impart is if a VC asks you for a coffee meeting, that coffee meeting is a pitch. There's no such thing as a coffee meeting with a VC. Every meet or an investor, every meeting with an investor is a, is a pitch. Uh, as an angel investor, I mean, it's funny because I used to not believe it, but now if I, if I find a very interesting startup and I meet the founder, like any, a casual conversation is a pitch to me. So I start asking questions about the company. If the person isn't able to answer, then I'm like, okay, doesn't matter, I'm not gonna invest, but let's continue the conversation about football or whatever, right? So, so use the opportunity to also, like there's, a, there's an elevator pitch, the seven second pitch, 30 second pitch, just like own that and, and you'll be good. Anyway, that's it. That's the last one. So thank you very much. If you guys have any questions, uh, this is a good book. Please, 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 uh, please get that on Amazon or in your local bookstore. But if you have any questions, uh, let me know. Yes. I'm going to point at you. Yes. Which one? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I've, I've said this like a million times in the presentation. <laughs> 
Yeah, I still have this book. Uh, I refer to this book every nine months, every six months. I've read it, co I've read it cover to cover, but I've had to go back to the book a million times because all these terms can get too complicated. Like these things, it's not complicated, but you just have to remind yourself. All right, all right, thank you. Okay, okay do we have any more questions? One more? Are you okay with Hello? Sorry? It's not, if you're a single, if you're a one person founder, it's not. It's about your product then. It's more about the product and you. It's about your hustle, your background, your, in, your customer empathy. But that's fine. That's fine, yeah. So long as you know what people, you know what the problems are and you, you are providing the right solution and your product has... I mean, growth and traction and MVP and so on. Yeah. But, but if, I mean, if you so happen to have a team that is also able to empathize with the customer, then that's great. But if it's not, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, how do you define uh, MVP? Does it necessarily need traction? Yeah, so what is an MVP? Does it need traction? And an MVP is, someone asked me this yesterday. So my definition of MVP is something that, a product that, I, that, that has good user retention, right? Now, how do you define that? Uh, there are many metrics, and you, there's some metrics you can look at. There's DAU, sorry, there's, uh, there's daily retention and weekly retention, s and, and monthly retention. So it, retention is basically, if, you, if you've got users in day one, in that same cohort of day one, how do they progress through day seven? If, they, if you have acquired a bunch of users in week one, how do they progress through week seven? or week four, right? Now, good apps like WhatsApp, WeChat, Facebook Messenger, Facebook all have a D7 or W4, a D7 retention of upwards of 65, 70%, right? Spotify, everyone else has upward of 40, 45, 50%. Um, a good app has a D7 retention of about 30 plus percent uh, baseline. If you're at 1% retention, then there's no point investing in growth because money you put in will be wasted, wasted by churn, right? So you look at your D0, D1, D2, D3, D7, W1, W4 retention curve and figure out where your users are dropping off. If your users are dropping off from D0 to D1, 100 users come in, 99 leave, and one stay between those two days, then you know you have a problem somewhere there. That means your value proposition is rubbish. But if you know that 100 people are coming in D0, and only six, only 70 of them leave in D7, so your D7 is 30, means you have some proposition. Try to figure out what that is and how to encourage them to stay on. So I would use retention as MVP. So 30% upwards is good. Most startups would land, depending on what your service is, if you're a website service, conversion funnels, right? If 100% land, 100 people land on your website, unique visitors land on your website, and no one buys your product, I mean, then, if no, forget buying your product. If no one submits a, a, a request for free trial, right? That means there's something wrong in your messaging or your product proposition. And work on that. And then one person will sign up. Speak, call that person up and say, why did you sign up? And they're like, oh, because I saw this small part of the product that you, 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 are, you are featuring. And then, and then if two other people sign up, you realize, wait, they're actually going in for that, then that's the proposition. You know, then you have to speak to the customers and figure out why they're, why they're, uh, they're, they're actually using your service. Yeah, speak to the people who are retained or go through your funnel or buy your product and ask them why. Speak to the ones who don't buy your product, the ones who, re who, who churn out, and ask them why. Uh, and then you'll sort of figure out what makes sense. All right, okay. thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Can we give him a round of applause? Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us today. So I'd like to remind you guys again to please do fill up the surveys. Hold it on to you. The redemption counter is open at 6.30. We have a lot of prizes for you to grab. We have PS4s and, uh, PS4s and uh, shopping vouchers and iPod shuffles.